I work for the AQA. Uh, I've done for a long time. Um, in a way, one of my jobs with them ends tomorrow when I set my last exam, my last A-level exam, which is a mop-up on the old exam for people who couldn't do it last year. You know, they were ill or a dog died the night before the exam was ever. And when that's done, that'll be about 15, no, 18 years of history, 23 years of history, setting a level exams, finished. So, it's a bit of a for me. But anyway, I was involved in writing the new spec for the, the new exam. Uh, and I know it quite well. And I've been around talking to a lot of groups around the country about the new spec. And it's surprising how often people have said to me from different parts of the country, it's all very well for you from Newcastle. You know, we know what an interesting place Newcastle is. But if you come from a rural area in Lincolnshire, what can we do there on changing places? It's always been the same, always will be the same. Or what if we come from a new town like Milton Keynes? It's daft. There's so much that, you know, all the local places have things going for them. But Newcastle does have, well, Newcastle and Tyneside, and we aside, and Teesside, I suppose, as well, does have so much going for it. They have so many very obviously very interesting places with good geography. And the Usburn is such a compact and such a packed area with lots of lots of stuff in there. Now when Liz talks to you, she she works for has worked with the Usburn Trust, which deals with a particular area where the Usburn joins the Tyne and the small area around that. In actual fact, the Usburn rises out near the the Sage building on Gosford, uh, Newcastle Great Park, up north of the city. And it meanders across the, uh, the sort of plain out there. It had to be, it had to do quite a lot of work on, on the Usburn when they were building the Great uh, Gos uh, Newcastle Great Park. It had to be landscaped and put in culverts and so on to stop it flooding. But they did an awful lot of work on landscaping. And in actual fact, I've been trying to think of ways you could use the Usburn for physical geography. And there's an awful lot of stuff you could do out there, <coughs> north of Newcastle, and areas that are very easily accessible on ecosystems and the way ecosystem, natural ecosystems manage ecosystems. Then the Usburn runs through Gosforth and gets lost in housing estates and so on and comes out much muckier than it was when it went in. Then it flows through Jasmine Dean. And again, there's work you could do on ecosystems. Probably not much on physical geography in Jasmine Dean because it is so managed that... Uh, I mean, I, I live right at the edge of Jasmine Dean. I've often thought, how could you do a physical geography work here? I've never been able to crack that one. But... It's an old mining area. You, you've got the remains of old mines down in down in Jasmine Dean, down near Pets Corner, and as you go through there, and there's a lot of data available on the old mining areas there. They flows into a culvert. It's all uh, built up <coughs> for transport networks to go across from east to west, uh, and then it comes out to the area that this was talk of as the Usburn Trusts area. She'll give you lots of information on that later. Um, but I've put up here, you can use the Usburn area for field work and you can use the Usburn area as a case study. It, if you go to that area, I hope you all do, if you go to that area, don't just see it as a place for doing field work, see it as a place for supporting your other studies, particularly if you're doing uh, urban geography, urban studies. <laughs> because it covers so many points on that part of the spec, which I'll try and come on to later. Now, you've got these sheets with my slide there and a space for writing there. And what I'm going to do is throw out ideas that most of this is just the spec. Down down the writing side, you can fill in some ideas of things that you might be able to do. Now, I know that 
in the, ex in the exam spec, or in the course spec, it says that your teachers are not allowed to tell you what to do. You've got to choose the titles for your own individual studies yourselves. I'm not going to tell you any titles. I'm going to make suggestions as to possible areas that you could work in. Uh, and you could, you know, I hope you can, if anything appeals to you, or you think anything might appeal to you, or might be a possibility, note it down here. Uh, there are so many possibilities. But also, always remember, it supports your, it supports your urban field, your urban geography stuff, and maybe some of your ecosystems work, maybe some other parts of the spec, maybe some of your population, but not as directly as the urban stuff. So how do you find the Usburn? The Usburn Trust defines it fairly, is a fairly narrow area. It spreads, the Usburn Valley spreads beyond that. Uh, I don't think Liz will mention it, but there's a place that used to be a, a big industrial development called Holtz, H-O-U-L-T-S, which is outside the Usburn Valley area, uh, the Usburn Trust area. That was abandoned as industry <coughs> and has been taken over by small business units and small RT crafty units. And it's fascinating. <laughs> there's so much you could do there. Uh, and then round, just behind that area, there was the, well there is, the biscuit factory. And the biscuit factory used to be a factory making biscuits, as its name suggests. And it doesn't make biscuits anymore. It's an art gallery. It's a commercial art gallery that entrance is free, but they're trying to sell art. It's not the, it's, it's contemporary art that they're selling. But it's co contemporary art that looks good in houses. It's not the way out stuff that you might get to the Baltic. It's, it's lovely, it's beautiful, it's domestic size, domestic shape. Sometimes you need a very big house to put it in, but uh, there are little pieces as well. So there's the biscuit factory. Commercial, aimed at a fairly wealthy market, but not ridiculously wealthy. But all around the biscuit factory, there have been lots of little things grown up in old industrial commercial premises. There's uh, the biscuit workshops. <laughs> I was in there trying to get some t-shirts printed fairly recently. Uh, they're very expensive, uh, even for cheap t-shirts. Um, there's the biscuit... Oh, there are cafes. They've, they've all got biscuit in the name. And they all... Biscuit, that's Sorry? Name. The way it's called the Holy Biscuit. The Holy Biscuit, yeah. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's an area that's brilliant. My son was walking through the other day, through that area the other day, and he got accosted by a lady who wanted him to, wanted to borrow his phone, then wanted him to ring her friend who to come and collect her because she was very distressed there. It's, it's interesting, you get all sorts of people there. And as he was finishing ringing her friend to get him to come, he said, yeah, I'll be straight away there. Will, our Will looked up, and there were six kids coming along on unicycles. And... <laughs> He thought, where have I landed? You know, am I in a film or something? And there's a circus skills school there. Is it in the Usburn? It's on the edge of the Usburn. For my purposes, it doesn't matter. Uh, or for your purposes, it doesn't matter if you want to stretch to go up to include, you know, how does circus skills development affect geography of a run-down industrial area? Uh, there are all sorts of little things. So, define the area as you wish. You've got a core stuff of fabulous resources that uh, Liz is going to give you, tell you about, but uh, extend it if you need to. So find areas that can be your purposes, and what are your purposes? So your teachers, and your main purpose might be to plan a piece of fieldwork for the whole class. And when teachers plan the fieldwork for the whole class, what they're often trying to do, they have to do, you have to do four days fieldwork. Most, most schools do that as whole class groups. And the key idea of that is to teach you some skills, to introduce you to an area, and for you to learn some fieldwork skills, and how to collect data, 
how to un present data and how to analyze it. You're learning skills when you do that. Now there's so much that the teachers could do in that area. Uh, from studying population, from studying uh, buildings, from studying urban structure, uh, looking at different kinds of change, looking at environmental quality, looking at housing quality, and so on, looking at ecology, looking at dereliction. There are a lot of things that you can start to learn, a lot of techniques you can start to learn. But then, the teachers want to be, to put you in a position where you can, you, you students, can develop your own ideas. So that's where, that's where the day comes in, really. If you're a student, the individual inquiry is going to be your main priority. You have, you, you've got to do the individual inquiry. You've got to come up with a topic of your own. Uh, Obviously, you're going to discuss it with, with the teachers, but it's your decision, your planning, your, you've got to sort it out. So that's you may encourage it, but I said, wouldn't it be good if you could also have a really detailed case study that you could use in a variety of different parts of the exam paper? As I say, particularly on the urban studies. But uh, elsewhere. There is nothing pleases an examiner better than when he's marking a, marking a paper and you mark an answer and some student somewhere, when they're writing a general essay, come up and illustrate it with a case study, not one from a book, but one that they've lived, one they've been out in the field and, and studied firsthand. And if you've done that, and if you know a place, your enthusiasm can come through the examiner. And the examiner can think, hey, this is brilliant. I'm giving this person good marks. But I'm also, you know, the examiner thinks, I am learning something from this. Because here is a case study that this kid has done and knows really well and is putting it over well because they've been there, because they've been enthused about it. And I can learn something. It doesn't often happen when you're examining, but when it does, Hey, it's great, and the marks flow. Uh, it, they really do, uh, if you're relevant. Uh, you will be relevant, though, because you'll have thought about it so carefully. And I think it's much easier to learn through experience than it is to learn from textbooks. As one famous geographer once said, we learn geography through the soles of our boots uh, by walking. I, I was once taking on a field trip and we walked across a plug plane. I said to the field said, it would be much better to walk across that way. You know, we're going across a boggy bit here. You're walking across that, you're not going around. So I put it on, through all this bog, and we got the bank beside the river and said, right. You will never forget what a back swamp is. You walk through a back swamp where the water's trapped because of the levees that built up, and you'll never forget that. And you know, 50 years later, I still haven't forgotten it. Uh, so these case studies that you've been through and experienced are, are splendid when they can come through into your exam essays. So, 19 slides are going to follow. Each one of them is a quote from the exam spec. And each, one, each section of the exam, exam spec can be illustrated very well from, from the Usburn area. The concept of place and the importance of place in human life and experience. Uh, it's quite a tricky one, that. How has a place affected people? Well, that, that, uh, that, that people talking about their life in the Oosburn area, not now, 
back in the back in the war days, all of all of them. Uh, that is people's lived experience of place. How place has affected them. How they've affected place, maybe. But it's that is crucial. Lizzie's stuff on the census is about people who moved into this area often, people who lived and worked in the area. Place has affected them. Uh, I saw Lizzie's stuff that she'd done a month or two ago, and um, there's one thing about the glassworks that we set up there. It turns out these glassworks were set up by, um, or, or I think by, Huguenot refugees who came over from the Low Countries and France uh, because of the religious persecution. And they had skills, they brought them here, and they set up glassworks because that's what they did. Uh, and she showed me one thing about a man who set up uh, the glassworks called Monsieur Hensel. Uh, fine. So happens that the man who lives across, the family who lives across the road from us, are called Hensel. And so I saw him and I said, yeah, he's a, uh, well, he's a Mackham, actually. He, he, he came to Newcastle from, um, from Sunderland. But I said, do you know where the Hensel name comes from? He said, I have no idea. I've never, never bothered to look. I said, it, it's a Huguenot name. Uh, migrants from the Low Country who came here instead of glassworks. That set him off on tracing back his lineage. And sure enough, the Hensels moved there. And then they moved on to... Some branches of the family moved on to Sunderland, where there's even more glass working, and then some of them moved back to Newcastle. Uh, which is place and lived experience and change and changing places. You probably won't find your next door neighbour reference there somewhere, but well, you might. And you might find you know you might find people who move from your area into the Usburn when it was developing and growing. So, there are lots of ways of finding out about place and how it affects human experience. But also, you are reading or listening to people's insider experience. They've experienced it living there. You then go and experience it as outsiders. You look on it in a more detached way. Whose view is better? Who understands the used burn area better? The person who's lived there all their life, or the person who's never lived there, but who studied geography, and has some understanding of how place develops? Well, it's impossible to say which of those views is better. They're two different views, and your view, as a student of geography, who then comes into this area, is as, as valid, in a different way, as the person who's lived there for many, many years. But, they're different. They're different views, and you need to be aware of that. Uh, you have to study the categories of places. Near places and far places. Now, the near place should be somewhere that you that is close to your school. I'm not sure just how far your schools are away from the used burn. Probably nobody actually lives right in the area, but you're all, you could use it as a distant place. It's not very distant for any of you, but it's different enough and distant enough to count. Uh, there's been a lot of debate in AQA circles as to just exactly how distant a distant place has to be, and we are as flexible as possible. So you can count this as your distant place, your far place. Uh, it's a contrasting place to where you live, presumably. You're going to experience it by going there, we hope, but you'll also experience it as a media place. You will read about it in magazines, in booklets, you'll view it on websites, you can get all sorts of uh, There are also websites that you can actually click on and find out people talking about the area. There's one 
building developer who was building a new estate in uh, near the mouth of Eusburg. And they built the estate, and as people moved in, they had a big welcoming do for all the new people coming in, for them to get to know it. And it happened that a lot of them were involved in arts, uh, media, such things. You know, they were the modern creative industries. And the film that they put on the website about this initial party for people to meet each other is fascinating. Uh, the people coming from all over the place. And obviously, it's done by the developer to show how wonderful his development is. It does look good. Uh, it does look exciting. If I was if I was a young person setting out in a media industry now and could get a house there, in amongst that hub of all sorts of creative people, you know, artists, sculptors, uh, musicians, uh, people in the media industry, and so on, uh, and people in hospitality, it's buzzing. It might be a bit intense to be so crowded in with people like that. But that video that's available on the website is it's great. It gives you a media impression, obviously filtered by the person who directed the, the video. But it's uh, you have to be aware of what it was up, put up there for and why it's been edited the way it's been edited. But it gives you an impression that you can then get an understanding of the place and of the way it's portrayed. On your changing place, you have to study facts, got to be the character of places, endogenous factors. That's things to do with the place itself. Uh, what's here? It's site. So it's location, where it is. It's, there's a, a valley running into the Tyne. It's a tidal valley. Uh, it's about a mile away from the centre of Newcastle. Uh, it's surrounded by working class areas that were were involved in shipbuilding, engineering, glass making, da, 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 all these things. That had a big effect on it. The topography, the valley is quite steep sided. Uh, there's not much of a floodplain. That shape of the valley has had a big effect on it. Um, physical geography, the tidal river, all these things. The fact that it was a sheltered, a sheltered place where boats could tie up easily and there's still fishing boats that moor there, and so on. The land use is very crowded, but a lot of the land use has changed over the time. Buildings have changed use. Uh, even if they've not changed use, they've often changed emphasis. So some of the pubs and cafes in there have probably been pubs and cafes before, but now they're different. Now they're music venues as well as pubs. Uh, now that you've got vegan vegan cafes, you've got all sorts of different kinds of cafes there. And then you go up into the biscuit area and you've got posher cafes and and then you drift into student areas where student housing's been built and you've got different kinds of services catering for them. But you go the other way and you're into the biker wall. Uh, again with a completely different kind of person, kind of land use, changing land use. Uh, there's one pub, which is probably in the Cumberland, in the uh, used by the Cumberland, Cumberland Arms. Uh, I think the story's right. This hasn't changed, changed with use. It's a fabulous location. It looks, you look out the, the pub, right up the river, right to the town centre. You, you can see all the bridges from the pub. The landlord is about probably over, over 70 now. Uh, he's worked there for many, many years. He owns the building. And over the last 10 or 15 years, lots of people have come to him and said, can we buy your pub? Uh, it's a perfect development site. Nah, I don't think I want to sit on. And uh, I can offer you a million pounds for the pub. No, I want to do a million pounds. I enjoy it to be life. A couple of years later, come on. We can offer you one and a half million. Tempted. No thanks. And it 
it went on like this for a while, and then he got to about 70, and he said, I can't go on like this for much longer. And he decided to sell for X million pounds, I don't know. So they were, he got all the lawyers in, and they were all drawing up contracts. And about a week, so I believe, a week before he was due to sell, he said, what do I want with X million pounds? He said, I've no one to leave it to. I'll probably leave to a dog's home or something. Why bother selling? I might as well stay here until I die. So he's still there, uh, and he hasn't sold out to big business. He will die. Don't to leave it to. It will get taken over at some stage. It's the kind of area with, all, with stories like this, which are geography. And they're about land use and location and topography, and that's going to be the character. The exogenous is relationships with other places. So how does the Oosburn link with the rest of Tyneside? How does it link with the coastal trade, the coastal shipping trade? In the past, does it still link with, with coastal trade at all at the moment? Uh, where does the money come to develop the new things that are going on there? Do you get outside investors? Is there international capital coming in to say, oh, I don't know, I don't know where the money's coming from, but there's certainly money going in. Some of it's coming through grants and development money. Some of it's probably coming through uh, lottery funding. I don't know, but it's a topic there for you to take up. It's relationship with other places. And Liz's census data shows how in the 19th century people were coming into this area from the countryside roundabouts in Scotland and Ireland and so on, coming in for work. Now, do your own studies. Where are people coming in from now to take on these uh, arts and music jobs and creative industry jobs? It would be very interesting to compare the present day links with the uh, 1911 links. Brilliant. So then, Changing Places talks about relationships, connections, yeah, we've done that. Meaning and representation, how different pictures mean different things, how different way, how the area can be sold in different ways, uh, how the way they're represented affects the nature of places and the understanding of places. Uh, And the way this change affects the life of the people living there. I mean, the guy who owned the pub changes, obviously had big influence on his lives, on his life. Uh, the old working class Geordie people who used to live there, have obviously their life has been changed by the incomers. Uh, the incomers' life has been changed by new incomers. So, changing demographic and cultural characteristics, and economic change and social inequalities. Uh, I suppose at one stage, this was a very homogenous area. It was poor. You're either poor if you lived there, or you were very poor, or you were grinding poor. Now, are the social inequalities greater with the newcomers coming in? Are there still poor people, or are they being pushed out? Uh, there's still council housing and social housing in the area that is worth looking into and comparing the two different parts of the, of the area and seeing how they affect each other. Because there are clear social inequalities, but do people rub along together okay? Do people in this area get absolutely fed up the teeth with students living, moving into the area, into the edge of the area? Are the students taking over the area? Or are the sort of hippie musicians taking over the area? There's an awful lot of scope for interviewing uh, the question, questionnaires. In-depth interviews, I think, maybe even better than questionnaires. And how is all this affecting the environment? And how is the environment affecting economic change? Because the environment has to be improved to bring in the, the investment. So you can study environmental quality, do environmental quality surveys 
in the area. It's getting a bit repetitive. I'm afraid the spec does get a bit repetitive around here. Again, you've got these same ideas coming through, but illustrating the place. So, external forces, the changing, gov changing government policies have affected the area. Uh, I'll, I'll come on to that in a minute when we talk about urbanisation. But, from 1979 to 1987, there was a Conservative government, which had, a, had particular emphases on its redevelopment policies, on, it, on its regional policies. They had a particular emphasis. In 1997, the Labour government came in and they had a different emphasis on how they supported the regions. And in 2010, Another change, and again, a change in emphasis on regional policy. I think there's a very striking contrast between uh, the Newcastle side, this is moving a bit out of the, out of the uh, Uber, I think. but the banks that tied on the Newcastle side were mainly redeveloped under Conservative government in the 70s and 80s. The Gateshead side was developed mainly under a Labour government in the Notice. Uh, it just so happened that the Conservative government had set up the lottery, and then the Labour government, when the Labour government was in power, the lottery had enough money to spend on that area. Uh, but government policy and its effect on the area, if you dig down, that is a very interesting topic to follow through. Uh, but that's on national scale, but then to what extent has the Oosburn been affected by multinational corporations and inward investment? Probably not very much, but there must be, there must be evidence of it in places. And then, what impact does the Oosburn have on the area beyond? You know, what do people, do people outside Newcastle even people within Newcastle know anything about who's there. I don't know, it's probably fairly limited. But when people do know about it, they get enthused about it. Final point on place studies, you must use sources. They must use qualitative, that's, that's the opposite of quantitative. Quantitative is numerical data. Uh, Census data are uh, particularly useful, but also the maps to show where places actually are, and counting and measuring to know how many examples of different things there are in the place. Qualitative is more, this is what people feel about it, this is what people think about it. It's not quite so, it's not clear cut, it's not hard and hard and fast facts, it's opinions. So this is perfect for getting both qualitative and quantitative to represent based in the past and the present. This has got the past data, you go and get the present data. It's not a history project, it's seeing how history has affected the present. So you need the historical understanding to then see how that's worked through the present. Take the both of them. And it's all got to focus on people's lived experience, talking to people. Right, that's the field work. Uh, the urbanisation topic includes economic, social, technological, political, demographic process associated with urbanisation. This was new, this was 19th century Uthburn. And there's still a lot of evidence for what happened there in the 19th century. And it's a perfect case study, and it's up. If you can write about the Uthburn in the 19th century, in an exam, you're writing about the real. And then, another separate part of the organisation, deindustrialisation and the rise of the service economy. Deindustrialisation was the disappearance of industry and the reason for its disappearance, and the service economy, I've banged on about that enough. It's everywhere in the Uthburn. It's, uh, 
it's children's books, it's the seven stories, it's the, uh, the city farm, it's all sorts of things in there. This is the urban policy regeneration, regeneration, seeing how policy has changed and how that's an effect on places. on human rights and urban forms, the way the actual shape of the land has affected land use. I mean, one thing is to look at the, the way there's been a, a barrier to communications. I suppose it helped with communications by, by a river because it was a nice sheltered docking place. But look at the cost of actually Travelling to east-west across Hughesburn, and the number of big bridges that have had to be built, uh, road bridges and rail bridges, metro bridges and so on, it's, it's had a big effect on land use. And there are parts of the land which are just obviously too steep to do anything with at all. And so they have now become green lungs for the city. Along with the, uh, the redevelopment, the cultural heritage quarters again. And it's, it's an example of gentrification of people moving in and taking run down old buildings and doing them up. It's good for the buildings, it's very nice for the people who move in. How does it affect the people who get pushed out or the people who feel overwhelmed? It's something to, to look into. I, I don't know how, how people are, as a whole are affected by the gentrification of the Ooze Burn. I don't know how many people think it's great, how many of the old Ooze Burners think it's great, how many think it's awful. Uh, it's something for you to find out, if you so wish. Linking into economic inequality, social segregation, cultural diversity, and contrasting urban areas. In the Usburn itself, I don't think there's that much um, immigrant migration, you know, non-white migration. I think there's quite a lot of migration in from outside the region. But around the edges of Usburn, going up into Biker and uh, going up to Shieldfield, there is a significant amount of uh, immigration. Or of, of different cultural groups moving in. Sometimes being very creative, sometimes causing tensions. If you want to look at river restoration, uh, it's the Northumberland Wildlife Trust has done quite a bit of work in the Usburn Valley. They're based up in Gosforth at uh, the old St Nicholas Hospital. If you want to look at restoration and conservation, you could get in touch with them. Uh, I started getting involved when they were doing a sort of conservation project to build floating islands to attract plant life and wildlife. And then swans were attracted to this and wrecked the things that they'd done and they had to restart again. <laughs> the swans liked them so much they pecked them to bits. Uh, that's a nice idea. Uh, I sort of lost touch with the people who were doing it, so I never uh, did much follow up on that. But Northumberland Wildlife Trust will be good. I'm sure that, uh, that the Usburn Trust could put you in touch with people who, who might help you with that, might give you baseline information. Urban waste is supposed In the past, there were industries that had disposal of waste, and there's evidence of that still. But now, half a mile from the mouth of the Usburn is the biker reclamation plant and the biker tip. I spend an awful lot of time at the biker tip, uh, either with building waste or garden waste or old computers. Uh, it's buzzing. You know, on Saturday afternoon, it's where the lads hang out. Uh, we all go and tip our waste in there and say how good it is to get away from home and so on. Uh, I think you do a fabulous study of the market area like a reclamation depot. Uh, 
But it could be a trigger for waste disposal and how people manage waste and the different types of waste, the different waste streams. And uh, there's, I don't know what, it used to be Shepherd's scrap metal. Is it still Shepherd's scrap metal there? Mm -hmm. is, is there any scrap metal? Yeah, yeah it was brought out by walls, so it's still scrap metal. Right. The grass is high at the moment, so they yeah. are moving. But is it, to actually look at the, the street, the different waste streams that are being generated by urban activity, and either used or reused or disposed of. Interesting. Uh, if you like that kind of thing. And how do we, does each of them impact on the environment? Uh, water pollution is a topic, and dereliction is a topic, and strategies to manage these environmental problems. So again, I don't know how you would do them exactly in, in there, but it's a possibility. And it's a, it illustrates the topic that you're going to be tested.